if you look at the title of my presentation, People, Place, Purpose, Leadership Skills in Consecutive Interpretation. Well, I know you must be wondering, leadership, that word sounds like a big term. Leadership is, um, you know, I think it's becoming a cliche nowadays. Everything and every industry talks about leadership and you need to have leadership this, leadership that. But what exactly do I mean by leadership? as consecutive interpreters. Um, well, I would like to start with some case studies. I want to basically present to you three different, uh, three real scenarios that I've encountered in my professional practice. And I want you to um, join me in thinking about what we can do, what we can do to um, think outside of the box, for lack of a better word, and exercise a bit of leadership on the job. Now, the first, the first of the three scenarios is this. Imagine that you are an interpreter, you walk into a workshop where you are hired to be the consecutive interpreter. Before this workshop begins, the speaker comes to you. The speaker admits that he has never worked with a translator before. And then they ask you, how long should I go before I let you translate? That's a very real scenario. That's a question I've had to answer millions of times. And my question for you is, what's the best, what's the most sensible way to answer that question? What should you tell them? Of course, you can imagine it's case by case, right? Your answer might differ according to the different circumstances. And that's exactly the point I want to make here, because you might think, well, how does answering this question have anything to do with what you called leadership? Well, that's exactly where you can exercise a bit of leadership, because the way you answer this question will basically determine the format of consecutive interpretation for a lot of people, for maybe 20 or even 30 people attending the workshop. And what you say, what you decide to do, will make a tangible impact on the kind of experience um, that these participants have. A lot of times these are actually important people whose experience will now basically be determined by you and how you feel like um, you should do, do your job. And let me, let me share with you the lesson that I learned the hard way. Uh, when I first graduated from my training program and started um, working in the market as a consecutive interpreter, I used to kind of almost show off my skills by saying, you know, sir, it's up to you how long you want to go because I'm trained to be able to handle about five to six minutes of speech. And that really dug a hole for myself because when you think about it, Doing that once or twice in a day is okay. I know when you're training, you do it, you know, typically you do one round of consecutive and then you get some feedback and you don't do more than five rounds or five um, speeches. Usually yeah. the job, you are for a whole day or three, four hours um, minimum. And it becomes really, really exhausting if you maintain, if you try to, you know, keep up with the length at five to six minutes. Do not do that and try to keep your chunk um, uh, short. I would say one to two minutes is very manageable, but of course it depends on how you feel and how you feel about the topic as well. Now moving on to the next scenario, the second scenario I want to take you through is this. During an executive MBA training session on leadership, the trainer refers to the leadership styles of U.S. military generals during World War II, Patton, MacArthur, and Eisenhower. Well, uh, by the way, for context, this is uh, an interpreting assignment I did in the U.S., okay? The speaker is an American professor. And then, um, you know, at some point, the professor said, when MacArthur became the president, he knew blah, 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 blah. That is the scenario. So if you happen to know about uh, World War II history, you might know that uh, the general who later went on to become the president was not MacArthur, right? It was Eisenhower. So in other words, I spotted an error in the speaker's 
presentation, he made a factual mistake,、uh, and clearly he knew. He knew it was Eisenhower. It was just a slip of tongue. But the question is, what do you do as the consecutive interpreter when you know there is a factual blunder made in the presentation? <laughs> and that, that's the question I I ask you guys. But basically, what I did, I just said one word. I said MacArthur. And then I paused. MacArthur, and then of course that was my way of giving the hint to the speaker that he had made、um, a, a, a mistake. He had this this、um, slip of tongue, and then of course he went back and corrected himself and said, "No, no, no, sorry, I meant Eisenhower, of course." So the moral lesson of this story is number one: a bit of general knowledge about everything really helps you go very far in this. Profession.、Um, if you don't know it, it's you don't know it. You know nobody can know about all industries. But if you, the more you know, especially about history, geography, the better. Lesson number two is that again, going back to the first scenario. The first scenario was you have the power to decide how long the speaker goes before you have the chance to interpret. And now. If you do keep the chunk short, this is a really good, you know, case in point that you can then、um, manage a lot,、uh, manage the uh, the uh,、um, the the way you interact with the speaker a lot better when the chunk is short. Imagine that the the professor had gone on for another three four minutes before it was my turn to interpret, and then I said, MacArthur, what do you think will happen? Right, the speaker would have long forgotten that he had that he said MacArthur. He must think he said Eisenhower. That's the point I want to make. Uh, you, 就是呃，刚刚那个情况是在逐步口译，您有时间去提醒讲者他可能口误。但如果是同步口译发生这样的情况的话，您会怎么处理呢 ？So in that scenario, um, it was a consecutive interpreting, so you had time to ask the speaker or To、um, remind the speaker of the of his、uh, mistake, but what if it was a、um, simultaneous interpretation? Oh, that's a really interesting question. When I was giving this presentation in, I think Boston,、uh, someone in my audience asked exactly the same question,、um, and my answer is this: When you are interpreting simultaneously. You want to you want to cover yourself, right? You don't want to commit yourself to something that's factually wrong. I think I would most likely generalize that message a little bit and say something like, later when one of the military generals became the president, he knew that da da da. So I would basically generalize MacArthur into something that's, you know, something that could refer to any one of the three. Um, generals. So, if there's no more questions, I would like to now move on to the third scenario. And as you can see, things become even more complex here.、Um, this scenario, scenario is also、um, an assignment where I was hired as the consecutive interpreter. But the setting is a bit special. It's it's kind of like speed dating, but for business people.、Um, I was.、Um, I was hired to be the consecutive interpreter for what they call B to B meetings. So basically, every five to six minutes,、um, the organizer will ring a bell, and half of the participants will move on to the next table. And this is a way to maximize the time so that different、um, industry players can learn more about each other one on one in a short amount of time. And here is exactly what happened. I was interpreting two businessmen, and they are from the same industry. They only had five minutes to explore possible ways to collaborate. Because they are eager to maximize the time, they repetitively interrupted my consecutive interpretation, and I began to feel frustrated. What should I do now? 就直接跟他讲说啊，我想要很准确的传达你最主要的信息，所以。啊、uh, ，就把你的主要信息给讲出来就好，因为我们只有这些时间。I would just tell them that 
because I want to interpret precisely. So, and you only have five minutes, so you could just um, um, elaborate your main points. Okay, well, that certainly is one solution, but let me just tell you what I did on the spot. I was kind of being creative in a sense. I, I had to think on my feet, and here's what I decided to do. To interpret song, switched from consecutive interpretation into whispering interpretation so that I don't need to stop them and wait for my interpretation to be finished. This way, I helped them double the time that they have. And again, because I call this, I call this uh, an example of exercising leadership because I had to think in their shoes. I had to think in their best interest. Their best interest is to buy more time so they can talk in more details about what they do and possibly work together as two, uh, two businesses. And that was a pretty effective solution. It made everybody happy. And I, you know, stopped feeling frustrated because, because my, I wouldn't be interrupted uh, when you whisper in real time, right? 那罗尼，我还是想问一下，因为刚刚您说的那个耳语的方式非常好，但我看到您图片上的那个桌子非常有一点宽度，所以你指的耳语要为两方的那个呃呃，就是他们的那个公司的代表人讲话的时候，你是
um, basically it translates as to read the air, right? To be able to understand the, the atmosphere in a room, which I think is a very um, vivid um, expression. I think what I'm talking about is the EQ aspect as opposed to just the IQ or the, the, the language aspect, the EQ aspect of interpretation. For lack of a better word, I just resorted to this cliche called leadership skills. Now, next, I would like to break this down for you of what exactly I mean by leadership and what are some aspects to it. And basically, my way to put it is that there are three P's in um, this package, people, place, and purpose. Um, what I mean by people includes the names and titles and also what we can loosely call the power relation among the different individuals. What I mean by place includes the cultural context, right? So what's appropriate to do in Canada versus in China or in Japan. You need to know that. You need to know the, the etiquette. <clears throat> and uh, also small talk, which I will you know, give you an example about. And the third P is purpose. And it also in includes two aspects of it a broader one and a narrower one. The broader one is what is the objective? What is it that uh, these people are looking to achieve today when they meet, right? So you wanna keep that big picture in mind. Um, and then you can also zoom into the uh, sentences and the paragraphs and think about what is the intended response. Now, I know some of these terms or some of these, these concepts are probably not making sense to you. Now I'm going to give you some, some examples and stories. My favorite example about people, and especially the names of people, involves this guy. Um, this guy is, uh, well, he's also uh, his worship. He's the mayor of Markham. Markham is a city just outside of Toronto. Um, in the, what do we call, greater Toronto area. And his name is Frank Scarpitti. Interestingly, Mayor Scarpitti also has a Chinese name, Xue Jiaping, which is well known in the Chinese um, community here in the, in the greater Toronto area. But basically, um, what happened um, one day when I was interpreting an event where the mayor was there was this, the bilingual MC or the host of the, uh, the hostess um, in, the, in this case, of the event was trying to introduce um, the mayor. And as you all know, the Chinese, Chinese speakers are generally really bad at remembering and pronouncing Western names. Garpiti is an Italian last name, which unfortunately didn't come easy for this um, for this lady. And what she said in English was, ladies and gentlemen, now let's welcome to the stage Mark <laughs> Frank Spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> and spaghetti, as you all know, is the um, the name of an Italian noodles, basically, which you know, made everyone laugh. But laughter aside, I think there's something we can all learn from such blunders. Um, of course, in this case, the mistake was, was, was uh, at the expense of the MC. But as interpreters, we cannot afford making the same kind of mistakes. And the lesson here is that if you know you're interpreting for someone important, and if you know the name of this person might give you trouble pronouncing it, practice it, you know, um, rehearse it several times in your mouth just to make sure that it comes out smoothly when you need to say their names. Uh, so with that, let's move on to the second P, place. And I want to tell you the tale of a glass of ice water. Um, and this is, this is the story. Um, when I was, I, to, I showed you the picture where I was interpreting for um, the mayor of Toronto and a delegation from Shanghai. And this is a story that happened <clears throat> during that project. Um, one day during lunch break, one, one of the younger guys, one of the younger gentlemen from the delegation came to me and asked me 
Uh, Roni, you've been in Canada for some years. Oh, I, one thing: Why do Canadians love to drink ice water? We, we just find it incredible, unbelievable that they drink ice water <clears throat> at meal. And I said, "Well, you know what? I I don't know." But what I did do was I passed on the question to the Canadian professor who was teaching the、uh, afternoon session. And five minutes before the afternoon class started, I started having a small talk with the professor. I said, "Well, well, I think he asked me how was lunch." I said, "Well, I had good lunch, but I got a question、um, that I couldn't answer, which is." Uh, Mr. Yang from Shanghai was asking, "Why do Canadians drink ice water?、Uh, do you know why?" The professor took note of it. He didn't give me an answer right away, but what he did was he then used the same question as the icebreaker for his class. He said, "Well, during lunch break, our interpreter, I think he said translator, but you know." I forgive him、um, because most people cannot distinguish translators from interpreters. He said, "Well, our translator passed on a question to me, which is why we Canadians love drinking ice water. You know what? Because I find it refreshing. Ha ha ha." <laughs> and then, to my great surprise, and perhaps to the surprise of everyone else in the room.、Um, His icebreaker invited some criticism from the audience. There's this gray-haired Dr. Chen,、um, who was part of the Shanghai delegation, who stood up and wanted to respond to that comment. And basically, Dr. Dr. Chen then took the floor and gave a two-minute lecture on why it's bad for your health to drink ice water. For anyone and everyone else, of course, from China, everyone else agreed with him. His theory was that when you eat lunch, especially a heavy lunch, there's a lot of grease and oil and meat in your stomach, and putting ice water in it will basically、uh, make it harder for your body to digest the food, and that actually adds to the obesity problem in the West. <laughs> As you can imagine, his comment then invited a lot of,、uh, you know, excitement and amusement, and it totally, you know, lightened up the atmosphere, the atmosphere in the room for the entire afternoon. The moral lesson of this story is again, small talk can make a big difference if you use it right. Is it something an interpreter is trained to do? Not necessarily, but if you use things like this really well, you can make a big difference to the outcome and to the、um, to the overall to the overall results. Now、uh, let's move on to the the third P, purpose, and I know I'm running slightly behind schedule, so I'll be brief over here.、Um, what I mean by purpose includes. The overall objective and the intended response. Today, I want to focus on the second bullet point, which is the intended response of someone's words. And here's exactly what I mean by that: when someone does public speaking、um, to a room full of、uh, listeners or audience, there are typically three types of Audience engagements or audience、um, responses that they might try to elicit. Your responsibility as the consecutive interpreter is to help them elicit that intended response, namely raising hands, asking questions, and. I want to give you. I want to give you a quick example about. Um, about raising hands. For instance,、um, if you look at these、uh, three logos, you might. So, what are they? They are the three big、uh, telecom companies in Canada. Well, at least in Upper Canada, where I live, Bell, Telus, and Rogers. I know on the West Coast there's Shaw and some other prominent、uh, players. But long story short, a speaker I was interpreting said, and this is a banker, right? This is someone. 
um, working for a Canadian bank who was trying to describe the landscape of the Canadian banking industry. And he wanted to use the telecom industry as an analogy. The point being that just like telecom providers, banks in Canada form an oligopoly. An oligopoly is an economics term, meaning that several big players um, taking up a, a huge chunk of the market share. And that's exactly his point. So he was asking, when you landed in Canada, you had to get a Canadian cell phone card, right? A SIM card. How many of you uh, signed up with Bell? And he paused for some um, for some response. I, and then it was my turn to interpret him. I had to basically read his mind and think, okay, what is the intended response from this question? Uh, what is the point he's trying to make, right? The point is um, about one third of Canadians use Bell, one third use Rogers, and possibly one third use Talos. Um, that being the point, uh, what I did was I interpreted differently. Now, let me quickly explain why I had to say something different, because I know for I, I'm Chinese Canadian, I travel back and forth between China and Canada all the time. So I know for a fact that Chinese don't usually um, get a Canadian SIM card when they visit, because China Mobile has really good roaming plans outside of the country, and you pay a lot less using the roaming plan than you go with a local SIM card, right? So again, that's just my, my cultural knowledge. That's just me knowing, um, knowing what makes sense for the Chinese delegates. So I know that if I interpreted uh, the, the speaker faithfully, the likely answer would be none. None of them signed up with Bell because they don't need to. So what I decided to do was I said, if you pull out your cell phone, you might see one of these three logos on the upper left corner of your phone. And as I expected, one third, exactly one third of the room raised their hands. Why? Because you might know that when you're roaming, your service is provided by the local partner of your of your home provider, right? Let's say China Mobile has a partnership with Rogers. And if you're a China Mobile user, you might see Rogers on the, the top left corner of your phone. And likewise, if you um, have another company, you may see AT&T or Telus or Bell. And that's what happened. That's one of the moments where I decided to do something smart, so to speak, to to get it work, to get it to, to get the message across, because the message is clear, which is that there are just as there are these three major players in the uh, in the telecom industry, there are the five major banks in the banking industry of Canada, namely TD, RBC, Scotia Bank, CIBC, and uh, BMO, right? So that, that must be familiar to you as well. Uh, I th actually, I think this story concludes uh, my presentation here. I'm gonna skip the next one. But now let's, again, take stock of what we've covered with the, with the stories here, right? So again, I wanna revisit this keyword called leadership. Um, one way to explain what I mean by leadership is that um, as you have seen from these stories above, when you are interpreting for a client, you're not just acting as the linguist in the room. Oftentimes you are actually functioning as a bit of a Client. That's the way I want you to rethink what you're doing when you are interpreting. I think uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you again, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you. See you all in. <laughs>